Good morning. It's Thursday, uh, May 6th, and we are here this morning on um, some housing issues. Uh, the first half of the morning will be taken up uh, talking to the folks of this um, emergency housing recovery working group and the letter. And our, this letter is posted online on today's. It's under Josh Hanford's name. And uh, I just wanted to do our continuing our due diligence on how we how we can hear about how this money is being spent uh, that we are receiving from the federal government. And I know that we have had you all in the committee um, throughout the session. And um, we're just interested to hear what this letter contains, why it contains, what it contains, and what the next steps through, the, the, through our budgeting process over the next couple of weeks is gonna look like with respect to how this money is discussed um, and managed. So with that, I'd just like to, again, welcome you all and pass the microphone first to Josh Hanf. Welcome, Commissioner. Well, thank welcome you. Back. And, welcome <laughs> thank, back. thank you and good morning. Um, thanks for having us in. Uh, for the record, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. And you were talking about um, Housing 101. <laughs> housing 101 right now is we need more units. Um, period. Um, it, a, a whole bunch of different uh, types and price points. And the time to do it is now with the ARPA funds. Um, housing has been uh, one of the areas most impacted by COVID in, in our opinion. Um, you know, we have folks that are homeless living in temporary unsustainable, unaffordable um, situations, and we need to build more units for them to live um, permanently in, in much safer places. Um, we also need to address um, the rising cost of uh, housing across uh, a number of our, um, you know, demographics and needs, in particular, you know, sort of entry home ownership. Um, it has really disappeared at this point with our, our costs uh, rising. Um, you know, folks have, have moved to Vermont, um, our relative safe, safety during this pandemic, and that's had an impact on our housing stock. Um, we know from our, our housing uh, needs assessments and, and looking at actual unit production over the last um, four decades, that really, um, you know, in the 80s was the last time that it looked like we were meeting our, our needs of um, building housing stock compared to what, what we need. Um, and it's gotten worse over the decades. And so the, you know, the governor's ARPA proposal for housing investment was large, um, you know, pretty much right up there with broadband in the $249 million proposed um, and then the first fiscal year, it was the largest allocation of all of the ARPA buckets, $129 million. And that was based on um, the acute housing needs right now that, um, you know, 102 million of that was dedicated towards um, providing rapid housing to uh, address the, the homeless um, situation we have and, and move people from the hotels and motels into stable housing rapidly. And um, the rest was uh, so, some more mixed income development and to start a program with a modest $2 million ask um, uh, in the first year to, to, to start a program, a home builder program to address that missing middle home ownership development in year one. And this working group um, was uh, established in um, the House of uh, Appropriation language to get the, the players uh, involved in um, housing, the funders, if you will, um, together. Um, and and the, the language, you know, asked us to, to look at um, the funding available and make recommendations uh, for its use, and particularly the ARPA funding. And the Housing Recovery Work Group consisted of Department of Housing and Community Development, Department of uh, Children and Families, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and Vermont State Housing Authority. Um, so we met several times. 
the reality is we were already meeting and talking, but this sort of formalized um, things. And um, you can see from our letter that, you know, we, we talked about um, that there are tremendous resources already dedicated towards housing as, as the budget process moved and the governor's, you know, one time um, at the time historic uh, um, support for housing when the budget was first introduced in January, you know, an additional 20 million to VHCB, an additional uh, one time 3 million to, to, to do VHIP, but that just, um, you know, pales in comparison to what we're asking for now and a lot's changed since that time. And, you know, the letter points out appreciative of the, the House um, approach um, in, uh, increase and then the Senate um, appropriations increase, but those numbers aren't enough. And they, in our um, opinion, also don't fully utilize the, the ARPA uh, funds available to address this critical need of housing right now. And so uh, I think we're suggesting there's a lot more available housing funding on the table that should be put towards housing now. Any delay is going to exacerbate the problem further. Um, we know that housing has been severely impacted and is eligible for ARPA funds. Um, and so waiting um, even another six, eight months to signal that to the development community that um, that this money we're holding back is is not going to help us at, at this point. We're sort of in a race to build and a race to get ahead of um, the lack of um, labor to build this housing and to coordinate our large contractors and construction companies to you know stay here in Vermont and build the housing that we need here rather than you know move to other big projects. This is going to be you know, sort of a, a race to uh, infrastructure builds and I'm putting housing in the infrastructure bucket. It is infrastructure. Um, and we have a plan here that coordinates housing development, other infrastructure, water, sewer, and broadband and climate change initiatives all at once at the same time. Um, and the other piece, and I won't take up, you know, all the other uh, folks that have joined joined us here uh, to talk about their, their elements. But one of the points we tried to, to reference in some of the sort of check marks there is we've had unprecedented dollars available for rental assistance, support, and stability assistance throughout this pandemic, and it's and it continues to be available, but as what's been missing from all these federal bills is actual capital dollars to build the housing, to put this to best use and to help people in our communities long-term by building the housing we need. And that is so apparent when, you know, we, we put together a funding chart of all the available funds to date plus proposals and the big gap is capital. With, and that's what this ARPA proposal for housing is all about. It's purposely not um, about um, additional support services or rental assistance, because those dollars are already available. And I think what you'll hear from, from some of our other funders, and I know um, Vermont State Housing Authority couldn't be here today, but they sent an email or a letter talking about all the vouchers they have sitting on the table that they can't use because no one can find an apartment. You know, I was on the refugee resettlement program housing work group yesterday for a, a long meeting. You know, the governors, you know, asked for more uh, refugee allocation to Vermont. We want to serve that community, but they are so struggling finding a place to move people. Our, our housing stock uh, is just not there. You know, they need larger units. And so this building of housing at all these different income levels and strategies we think is the right solution right now. Um, and it needs to make it over the finish line before the end of the year. Um, so hopefully I, you know, I, I, I hit on the high level elements that you were looking for. Um, and just one last piece, you know, it, it housing really doesn't work. Um, it's, 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 unless it's holistically, you can't um, work on one element of housing and think you've solved you know, um, that demographic without affecting every other sort of housing need. You know, 
folks that can move into a starter home are opening up rental properties that folks maybe that were in subsidized apartments are now moving into unsubsidized, but quality rental. And it's a whole cycle of housing. And Vermont has been missing a very uh, big piece of that, which is that moderate naturally occurring um, uh, starter home builds in the state for a long time. And we have no programs to so incentivize and work on the supply side of that. And so that's new in here. Um, you know, and there's a, a, a large element of this, obviously, that is dedicated toward the acute housing needs of the folks that are, are, are it, it, homeless at this point as this sort of emergency element. And what's been dedicated so far, um, uh, 40 million of general fund is not, not enough to address that need. Um, and so this work group letter basically asks for larger infusion of ARPA dollars to, to build housing. Um, so I will stop there and, and um, either take questions or pass it on to whoever you'd like, Chair. Yeah, I've just got, um, we have a question from, from a couple of people, but just very broadly, and I think this is a question for everybody who's in, uh, who's reporting on this letter. First of all, I cannot, I, I cannot understate the, the disconnect that's in my head when I hear about how much money we have to spend on housing and how quickly we have to spend it after you know, being undercapitalized for other reasons, but that due to this, this pandemic and that these funds are available, that, that, that we're seeking ways to spend this money correctly and, and, and worthily. And I appreciate all the work that's, that's going into it. Josh, and again, for everybody, one of the things that I wanna make sure, and not necessarily for today only, but just in general, what I'm not hearing is what it's going to take. I mean, we've referred to this as a moonshot in the letter, and, and that's kind of what we're talking about. But housing has to be built on land. And we, the, the affordable housing world, has been largely re reactive over the years, right? It's, it's like, oh, look, there's a fire downtown. We can rebuild. Oh, look, there's a flood downtown. We can rebuild. And it's using land kind of in a reactive way. I'm just thinking, are we, in, I hope we're including the, the, the need that we're, we're being proactive here, which means we're entering a market that will potentially, you know, make, I mean, we know that land is competitive and it's going to affect the price of everything. And it's just, this is just a long way of saying a lot of this, are we accounting for the fact that land purchases may be going up and that people are going to, you know, not sell or be drive a hard bargain or, you know, has that been built in the time frame at all? You know, so what I would say, I, I would, I, I would not agree hundred um, percent with what, what you said, um, Chair Stevens, there are housing projects that have been very proactive and planned for years. They just take sure. 10 years to develop the funding. I mean, I can think of several that I went on site visits five years ago. <laughs> under a different governor as deputy commissioner, and they still haven't made it to the funding uh, even rounds yet because there's so much of a pipeline. And I think this letter points out that there's 30 projects that we already know of that if we had this funding, we could get underway all across the state. Um, and that's not even putting a message out and saying, bring us your other projects we don't know about. There's already 30 we know about. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's just it just reactive. It, it's it, it's looking ahead to the opportunities. And, you know, I think you're right about the added expense. You know, I, I've heard it described as the four or five L's, you know, labor, land, um, you know, um, uh, <laughs> uh, lumber, you know, just as representative of the cost drivers these days. Um, but, you know, some of these projects have opportunities that, you know, land has been donated or there's been other uh, ways to acquire this property. And that in and of itself doesn't um, bring down the cost to, to make these, you know, all of a sudden a, a lot cheaper. We know that costs are going up. I've talked to dozens of different developers since the governor's plan has been announced talking about their planned projects, or I should say things that are already underway and they've seen the costs go up $50,000 per unit just in the last nine months. 
Um, and there's no expectation that those costs are coming down anytime soon. In fact, just the opposite. So without a big infusion of dollars, the um, housing builds are going to go down and the problem is going to be worse. So I don't think the choices are um, anything other than that. We have to invest more to stay ahead of, of worsening this problem. Um, and so, yeah, I, it, there are lots of, of planning that goes into many of these projects and a signal that there's more support to build housing that is not just shovel ready, but shovel worthy. You know, we, we talk about that. Um, these projects all have to go through the same sort of uh, review and scrutiny and, um, you know, permitting that they, they always do. Um, so, you know, it's public funds, there will be that oversight um, to ensure that these are worthy projects to be funded in the end, so. Oh, that's great, thanks. And I don't, I didn't mean to diminish the, by, by saying reactive, it's just. Yeah, no, I know, I know what you mean. <laughs> so, Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Chair, and, and Josh and Sarah and the team, thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And, you know, this um, $249 million plan that you put together, I, I think there's some amazing components to it. Um, I'm unclear right now. Um, in your letter, are you talking about adding to the, the $70 million ask that you have for the things in the existing pipeline? I, I'm a little unclear about what your ask literally is. In each of your mitigating homelessness, there's about $102 million in your plan. There was the $90 million. And so your letters, I just, I have to be kind of line specific about what you're actually asking for so that we can work with Rep. Jessup there from our housing perspective. I mean, I'll put it in, you know, really basic terms, at least from the governor's office. There, in, so far, there's only $17 million of ARPA money put towards housing. The governor asked in, in fiscal year 22 recommendation, the governor asked for $129 million. That's a pretty big difference. Um, you know, you, if you look at 40 million of general funds that was put towards VHCB and, and deduct that and say, well, that's getting closer, there's still a big gap. In the governor's proposal, um, in the legislation that was presented in year one, there's 102 million dedicated to VHCB. You know, we're only at 40 right now. So I, I think the letter, you know, um, you know, basically is saying, the housing investments that the governor proposed is what we think is needed to so actually solve the problem. Um, and, you know, policy choices around where this money goes, um, what are the highest and best uses of it? What we're saying is housing is the highest and best uses of it. It's clearly eligible for, for ARPA money and it should receive a higher priority of ARPA investment. Um, and, you know, you could go line by line, you could go however you want to look at it, but the, the, the amount of support of ARPA money for housing is very different as the budget stands right now um, compared to what the governor um, proposed. My last question, do you have an, a, a grid of what the governor proposed and what's currently been appropriate in the legislature for each of, for the 249 million? Um, yes, I mean, I'd probably the best way is to look at um, what was submitted to Chair um, Hooper by Finance and Management. It has a very specific line of every area, but if you focus on the housing, it's really only a couple lines. It, it shows the difference between what's been proposed so far and the recommendations of where ARPA housing dollars should be filled in. Um, compared to what what's available, and so at least from my my perspective, I, I would I would point to that as being the uh, you know a line by line specific ask to 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 sort of correct the um, uh, investment in housing that we think is needed to to address the very real problems and challenges ahead. Okay, thank you, Representative Trano. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, as always, thanks, Josh, for coming in and uh, giving a great presentation. But um, so my question is, um, we're seeing um, more. Uh, um, am I, no, uh, we're seeing more restrictions or or eligibility requirements on the new 
how um, a rental arrears program. So my question is, can we, do we, are we able to uh, direct uh, or appropriate ARBRA funds to capital investments at this point? Are, are, is that within the guidelines that we're seeing? So the, um, the emergency rental assistance program, there's ARPA one and ARPA two. ARPA two is funded out of uh, nuts, I'm sorry, ERAP, ERAP one and ERAP two. ERAP one is what is being deployed right now. And there's and that was in the December recovery bill. There's no questions, it's been a challenge. It's been slow, it's not as nimble as what we stood up with the CRF money. Um, there's been challenges nationwide, um, tons of them. We're doing better than I would say um, what you're seeing across the nation. Um, Vermont State Housing Authority has already approved um, 1,216 applications despite all the challenges. Over six and a half million dollars has been approved and is out the door this week. And that's in a soft launch. If you'll notice, there's been no marketing or advertising of this program yet because the vendors have had challenges. There's been issues. Um, we should see by the end of this week that sort of changing. They're feeling comfortable enough that the um, web portals and all that aren't gonna crash and be problematic. They've worked out the bugs. So you should see more, but you should know that that amount we've spent is more than huge states like California and New York. We've already beaten what they've been able to do with this money. Um, the next round of that emergency rental assistance that was funded in ARPA is um, they haven't released all the rules yet. Uh, we have to submit an application May 10th to just be eligible for the funds, which the agency of administration is doing. They're on top of it. Um, but the ARPA flexible state recovery dollars are read of the limited guidance so far. And it's true, all the guidance isn't out but that there's no one that can argue with a straight face that um, the pandemic hasn't affected housing. It has affected housing very clearly. And so we're very confident that when that full guidance comes out, um, housing construction capital to address the need will be an allowable use. That's great to hear. That was my primary question. Thanks, Josh. All right, um, Tommy and then Barbara, and then I want to move on to Sarah Phillips from the Office of Economic Opportunity. Tommy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, Representative Kalakbe stole part of my thunder, but I'm going to build on that. Uh, housing funding is bewildering in normal times, and with this manna dropping from heaven, this time I, think I find it even more bewildering. And so I'm wondering if if it exists or if it doesn't exist, that somebody create a flow chart for us, of, uh, which includes the asks and which includes our regular funding and what might be, what is available through ARPA and where is gonna go, what kind of program, because it's so hard to track how much money there really is available and where it's going. I find that, <laughs> Like I said, in normal times, bewildering, and it's even worse now. Is there such a document, or if not, is there somebody who could create that for us? Um, I, I think we have created that, and um, we've certainly shared it with um, leadership in the legislature, the appropriations committees, committees. I believe um, this committee and and uh, Senate. Um, it it. it it's a massive spreadsheet that shows um, all of the new uh, money that we've already put to work and all the proposed money sort of um, related to this pandemic and all the eligible uses. And it, it's, it's, it's massive um, and we can share it again. Um, what it doesn't take into account is um, sort of the, the regular ongoing commitments to housing that we see in um, every reg regular year. Um, there's a housing investment report that DHCD does each year and, and it's, it, we submit to the legislature. It's on our website that does that. It sort of shows all the capital dollars for affordable housing development as well as 
service and rental assistance dollars from AHS and HUD and everyone else every year. And you can, you know, look back and see, you know, multiple years of if the money's going up or going down, I often feel it's an under reference document um, by, by policymakers to look at what really is available um, as housing funding um, from the state and federal government. Um, I can send that to the, the committee. And then between those two is the entire picture, which is um, very large and will, will take some time to digest for sure. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Uh, if, you know, even if it's a massive spreadsheet, that would be helpful. But there isn't a, a simplified flowchart kind of thing. It might be really easy to say, oh, it goes from here to here to here. Because part of the problem, it goes from into an agency, and and then it may go into different programs, and it's really hard to track. Yeah, we can, sure. find, we can yeah. find, I, we may have that, we may have had that on our, on our wall at some point. We'll try to find that, Tommy. There's, there is a simple two-page listing of money that's come in since last year and where it's been assigned to in general, but, um, but we can, let's just take a look before we ask them to do, whip up anything or even, we'll, we'll take a look through our files and see if we can find that. Okay, thank you. That would be yeah. very helpful. All right, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I'm just curious, and, and this could be kind of to anybody here, I think, but certainly to Josh, and thank you all for being with us. One of my concerns with the ARPA money is only that once spent, it it's done. And, and I, I, especially thinking of entry-level homes and trying to make it something that is sustainable um, in, in, to go forward and keep those homes affordable, that the revolving loan fund system where it, it, it's a pact and it, it, it's all structured what you can um, gain in equity, but then it comes back into the program and that we can't do that with, with the ARPA monies or any money that if, you know, if not spent by has to go back. I know there's, and maybe I'm misidentifying my concern, but I, I just do appreciate that. I think one of the things being looked at in trying to use ARPA dollars to supplement general fund, it, which makes it complicated in trying to follow where they're spent, is that when you spend the general fund dollar, we do have the ability to say, when it comes back to us, we can ship it back out to another home buyer, to another structure and, and grow a system that hopefully does keep the housing ongoing. And, and I just, I, I don't know if my question's been clear, but I just am a little bit curious if some of the monies the governor's looking to allocate in the big picture um, don't allow that perpetuity piece. I guess my question is how would, how would the state continue to own some right to that structure of house if they just give a grant to somebody to buy a small house, an entry level home? Um, yes, I, I know what you're getting at. And I think, you know, that there's a couple things going on here. You know, certainly the, um, the VHIP um, homeowner revolving loan piece is in the base budget, and that's meant to go on going so that money revolves as those homes are sold or transferred. And that's a, a small amount to pilot. Hopefully it grows. Um, the thought here with this home builder program um, is a little less of a um, incentive per unit, and it's simply... Um, to try to, to address the supply side problem, to get more home builders to bring homes online for sale at a price point below what they naturally would bring them on right now to make any margins, those homes are going to be $600,000. We want to bring them down. And we're seeing that already happening. I was talking to a home builder that has a 50 unit project. Um, half of the homes are built. They were bringing them online, unsubsidized, private at the high 300s 10 months ago. They're now at the mid 400s. And that gap is only costs of construction that have been seen in the last 10 months in increase. And they've already seen the people buying them change. They had families. Now they're seeing early retirees, no, no kids in those new homes. And it's, it's a stark contrast that um, we think that subsidizing the cost to bring these online, whether that goes towards construction, labor, land acquisition, is worth a $30,000, $40,000 subsidy 
to bring these homes to a more affordable level and they, but they wouldn't have an ongoing state ownership or, you know, that sort of, um, this is, is a lower subsidy. It's a market supply infusion. Um, there are other programs that do have ongoing, you know, liens and covenants and perpetual affordability that is still general fund money is, is still double than what it's ever been. And those, those programs will be in place and they'll be enhanced. And with this ARPA money that goes through VHCB or other affordable housing partners that end up in perpetually affordable housing projects, that'll all, all still be there. The difference is the ARPA money can't be um, revolved and relent out. It'll have to go in as a grant. Um, but most of those even state resources, at least in the multifamily perpetual affordability, they often don't revolve. They stay in the project as a commitment. They're always there, but the reality is the, the cash flow is not enough on those affordable rents to, to pay back those loans. They act as an ongoing, um, you know, deferred, deferred loan in perpetuity um, in, in most cases. So I don't think that's going to be drastically different with this, this money. It's going to, you know, in fact, work the same, but we may have to call it an outright grant with ongoing perpetual affordability covenants to achieve the same goal. So I don't think that'll be diminished. It just will be some different ways of doing business, but happy to open it up to Jen or Mora to talk about this aspect. They may have some other thoughts or, or strategies here. Yeah, let's- Thank um, you. I'm, I'm gonna go off mic, but I just did wanna say, I appreciate the affordable covenants aspect that, that something like that, that is, some kind of claim to this, so thank you. All right, thank you so much, Josh. Um, it is so much information, and you know, it, I certainly hope that the capacity of your 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 department is increased a little bit through this to help you manage what is, um, you know, what is a, uh, an incredible increase in the hours that you'll need to get this work done. So. Um, I hope that the administrative fees are going to help you out there. Um, Sarah Phillips, same, I'll say the same thing. I, I appreciate the fact that you're probably working 128 hours a week and, um, and uh, took part in, in this, in today's. I'm so grateful for your time. So if you could just share from, from your office's perspective what, what, what's in this letter that's important for us to know right now. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, for the record, Sarah Phillips, I'm the Director at the Office of Economic Opportunity and the Department for Children and Families. Um, and really appreciate that this committee is taking up this letter and invited us in today to talk about um, what we've raised up. And so I'll just try and, again, I'm not gonna repeat what Commissioner Hanford has laid out, but just highlight a couple things, like you said, Chair Stevens, that rise up for DCF in particular and that I think the committee might be interested in. <laughs> Just to start by saying this morning we had, uh, we have 1,900 households approximately in motels, 250 are families with children. Um, we know that um, the CARES Housing Voucher Program, which is how, um, if you all remember, how we mobilized our HUD Emergency Solutions Grant CARES funds um, to provide uh, rental assistance vouchers to uh, almost 400 households experiencing homelessness, prioritized families with children. So about 90% of those families in motels have vouchers right now, just to highlight that. Um, we have about 200, and 200 folks with the CARES Housing Voucher Program that have leased up and moved into new housing. And we have about 220 that are looking for housing right now. So um, the 200 that have leased up, that, that's good news. That, that's because of the investments that we made last year, right, about bringing on new units and new capacity and, um, and the partnerships between um, uh, homeless assistance providers and using the coordinated entry process to get folks into units that were rehabbed through VHIP into new units that were created uh, with funding VHCB administered. And so um, there's good news in that story, but obviously the work is not done. And I think that's, that's the message overarching that we're bringing to this group today. Um, I just wanna also name that uh, the, the House in, uh, in House Appropriations and the House in naming this housing recovery work group um, 
also named, as you all are aware, the General Assistance Emergency Housing Working Group that DCF and advocates and um, others have been working on to put together um, policy recommendations and a budget proposal around emergency housing and State Fiscal Year 22. And it's really important to say that that working group made its recommendations and did its work uh, with the knowledge of this ARPA housing proposal. And, uh, and it is really important to that working group and all of the advocates on that that we make this major investment in housing and in particular permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness and make those units available. So I just need on behalf of that working group to name um, the, the strong, um, strong advocacy that that group feels for this proposal for the ARPA housing investments to move forward as well. And then I just want to name as well, I know that there's always a concern around those three legs of the stool, right, um, and capital funds um, or units um, in rental assistance and subsidy and services. And I know that often we're looking to the Agency of Human Services and DCF uh, to leverage and to um, bring the services to the table. And so I just want to also identify that we have, uh, we are leveraging the emergency rental assistance program, the ability to use a certain portion of that fund for housing stability services. We have issued an RFP specifically for housing stability services, and we are in the process of making about $6 million in awards uh, for additional service capacity to help folks uh, both apply for emergency rental assistance funds, but we also know that people experiencing homelessness um, are eligible uh, for ERAP funds, so to help them apply, but also help them find housing and then help them keep housing. And so that is a focal point for us in making those investments. Of course, the ERAP funds for housing stability services um, are not long-term. I think as Representative Murphy was pointing out that we need to be thoughtful about um, federal funds ending and and uh, how much is what we're doing based on a, a surge need in services and how much is needed in long term in an ongoing way. Um, I think we would uh, put forward that uh, not every household needs long term intensive home based support services to maintain housing, right? I think we all recognize that. Some households do and some households just need a boost. They need, you know, a little bit of help um, and some support services and get connected to, you know, all of the services that exist out there and some need a little bit more, you know, maybe a year or more to get back on their feet, get connected with employment services and, and uh, workforce development, get connected with other benefits and programs that might support them in the long term and help them with long term economic security. So the housing stability services meets, meets a, a really important gap and I would just say that um, as AHS committed last year, we have been working on the ability to um, seek approval under our Medicaid waiver to support permanent supported housing in the long term. That work has continued and I expect that uh, later this month, if not in June, that, um, that we'll be presenting sort of what, what's, been, uh, uh, what's been proposed under that uh, to CMS for uh, waiver authority for permanent supported housing. So that work has been continuing as well. So I just wanted to highlight sort of the service side of that. Um, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't, we see that actually it's, it's amazing, but at this one moment in time, we actually feel like we have some really wonderful opportunities around uh, filling the service gap. We have an incredible amount of temporary rental assistance and um, new emergency housing vouchers coming online at, per, per, at uh, public housing authorities. Um, I think you, you see mentioned in the letter the work that we're doing to um, connect folks uh, with permanent affordable housing, not just with their temporary rental assistance, but to work with the public housing authorities around the ability to move on to a permanent housing voucher. That's work that our working group has engaged in, how to more tightly braid our systems together so that, um, so that it's working. But we definitely feel, continue to feel the pinch around lack of uh, units. And so, um, so that's, where, that's where we're sitting. I just wanted to add that into the conversation. Thank you. Representative Triana, thank you, Sarah. Representative Triana. Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. I had an inquiry recently about um, uh, electric uh, or power or um, arrears uh, and help paying um, uh, overdue electric bills. Is that money in place yet? And if it is, how can I direct someone? 
Yes, I'll make the assumption that you're talking about a residential and not commercial. Yes, utility. It's yes, residential utility bill. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm happy to follow up afterwards just based on the particular okay. situation to make sure that I'm directing you to the right resource. Maybe that's okay. the most important. If I could jump in just to Maura Collins from Vermont Housing Finance Agency. It will be important for legislators to know that depending on if the utility bills are renters or owners, there will be different okay. systems set up. So okay. we can make sure you're connected with those resources. Um, they will be coming online at different times, but there will be utility assistance available to uh, both renters and owners. Okay, great. Thank you, both of you, thanks. Well, thank you, Sarah, for that update. Um, I'm gonna move right to Maura Collins and and then to Jen Holler. Let's, I just wanna make sure I get the testimony in before and we'll come back for questions after that being mindful of, of, of the time here. Um, Maura, welcome back. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, Again, more Collins, VHFA, Josh covered a lot of it and Sarah covered everything that wasn't said, so I will be quick. Um, one thing that this working group has also done is talk with public housing authorities, not just the state housing authority, but the local PHAs um, across the state. And in that survey, um, the Barry Housing Authority, I'm going to read this quote, um, respond. We were asking um, about some real technical things. And we said at the end of the survey, is there anything else you want to add? We weren't even looking for um, this kind of information, but Barry Housing Authority said our current voucher holders uh, that are searching for housing are having a hard time. Let's just start over. Hold on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our current voucher holders that are searching for housing are having a hard time securing housing with the limited stock of rentals available in our area. We are currently offering an incentive to pay full security deposit and first month's rent to landlord for new admissions. We heard similar comments from the Brattleboro Housing Authority. You have the letter from the State Housing Authority. I believe Sarah could speak to some special um, agency human services vouchers where I've heard that that was the problem was fine. The reason um, that money took a while to deploy was the lack of okay. units. Um, to speak to Representative Walls's question um, about understanding the numbers, by my math, the governor's request of using these ARPA funds is about $249 million, as Josh had said. And H439 right now has 59 million um, for these types of uses if we set aside the rental assistance. So that is a difference of 190, more than $190 million. Um, all that money can't move in year one. That's why the plan has been to spread this out over several years. Um, but these developments are complex. And to speak to Representative Murphy's point about not wanting to lose ground in terms of affordability and um, covenants and all that, to make sure that the housing that's being developed remains as high quality as you all support year after year through VHCB funding and the rest, we need to signal to the market that this money will be available so that they take the time to find the right infill development downtown, preserve um, the historic structures and things like that while also providing this important housing. And so signaling that this money will be available now actually helps to have higher quality projects in the future as opposed to having a holding the money back and then having a rush for this. We are all concerned about the workforce. It's very limited. The way to fix that though, is not to wait for the construction workforce to magically correct itself after it's been so anemic for so many years, but it's to send a message now to contractors that there is substantial funding available to support rental, um, sorry, residential construction so that they can staff up. This is similar to the um, discussions we've had with the state's ratings, uh, with the rating agencies. The state has been um, downgraded because of its demographics. And instead of waiting for the demographics, 
to magically change. We need to make smart investments to ensure that we are um, a welcoming state. And similar for those of you really focused on equity and what the legislature can do to support racial equity as well as um, other ways of making sure we're a welcoming state, making Vermont more affordable makes it more welcoming to newer residents and to existing residents. We have been watching our pipeline grow since discussion of investment dollars have been um, happening publicly. Josh mentioned that his phone's going off the hook in terms of hearing from developers. I know VHCB, Jen's smiling and nodding. VHCB has um, a, a long pipeline. VHFA's pipeline looks very similar to VHCB's. We fund a lot of the same projects. Um, at the average, these, the, I don't want this in statute, but I'm going to say, if you assumed about all the phone calls we're getting from developers so that you know what this looks like, if you assumed that their unit estimates are correct, which they won't be because by the time they get through permitting, you know, they'll be cut. And if you assume that all the average um, cost of construction is just a stagnant, nice round number, which it won't be because it never works out that way, we're talking about well over a billion dollars of economic activity. It actually gets closer to two billion, but I'm trying to be conservative. So this would have a huge boost to the state's economy. And the last thing I want to say is that our state has been chasing this mythical unicorn, some of you are aware of it, of 4% tax credits. This is a program that VHFA administers and it is an underutilized resource, but for good reason. And that's because it doesn't work unless we have the kind of money that we're talking about today to pair with it. It's not a, it's a federal resource that doesn't cost the state money, but it is not easy for us to tap it because it needs so much other money to leverage with it and support it. And that's why we are limited into how much we can use that resource. But what we have an opportunity for today is that we have, we can actually catch this unicorn because this ARPA money could be the kind of match that allows us to unlock more of these federal resources. And so that's just another opportunity that we um, have in front of us if we can embrace this full proposal. Thank you. So, so Maura, are you saying that our expectation over time, um, thank you for bringing that up because it is, it, it, and maybe we'll hear more about it as time goes on, but it is kind of a unicorn. Um, I, the bigger unicorn is the 9% that, that I'm always, that I'm used to from working at Downstreet and through this committee, which is even less, um, plentiful, the, the 9% um, that we've always attached to the, the trust fund money, you know, just so, or, but are we saying that when we look, when we're looking at the amount of money, uh, uh, traditionally we say, oh, this amount of money will then in the, grow this much money in a project that you, you know, whether it's four to one or seven to one or 10 to one, but are you saying our expectation should be that that the money that we're spending on housing is a little bit more retail and that and that the, the matches will be slightly less? Uh, the governor's proposal includes home ownership and includes many kinds of rental housing that kind of deeply subsidize what Sarah was talking about, uh, units that need services and more investment because the residents may not be able to pay as much for their rent and contribute as much and therefore those projects may not be able to have debt and mortgages on those buildings. Then there's going to be other kinds of projects, which are uh, the sorts of projects that we hear about with towns that have inclusionary zoning or in Act 250, there's priority housing projects where um, there are incentives to have below market rate rentals. But that doesn't mean that those rental rates are all the way down um, to be um, uh, are all the way down to a low enough point that let's say a person living on um, supplemental security income, disability income can afford. So there is going to be a broad range. I do not have numbers of how, um, I wouldn't wanna say what that overall leverage can be. What right. I wanted to point out was that in the very complicated program of tax credits, which is our nation's largest program of supporting rental housing development is through federal tax credits that there are two types of tax credits. 
and they make it easy because they use numbers. So 9% and 4%. And we all can tell that nine is twice four. So it's much more valuable to get the 9% credits. And there is less of that gap that needs to be filled. And those are very mission driven projects that um, are serving the homeless and um, can be more costly, but also are producing a lot more for communities in terms of affordability. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a resource with these 4% credits. It just means that the 9% credits can often pay for maybe 70% of what it, of the pie chart of what it takes to build a, a development. And the 4% tax credits, the money doesn't go as far. It's not as valuable. And that can only pay for 30, 35% of the pie chart of the total development costs for a project. And so there's more of a gap on 4% credits. And this ARPA investment can help fill that gap. And it will take other resources as well. But um, this is why we're so, I'm so passionate. We're also passionate about this um, investment being made because we would love to turn to all those people who are calling us with their pipelines to say, yes, the state has committed that the money will be available. It's not all gonna be available in year one. We're going to um, you know, smartly still um, only fund what can uh, be absorbed by markets, but sending that signal to builders and developers and planners is really important now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pop right. Thank, thank you, Maura. Again, this is this is, it seems a little bit you know higher elevation conversation, but also it reflects the fact that so much is still the gears are still moving on on all of this, um, and will be through the end of the session. Jen Holler from VHCB, um, welcome back. If um, you can share your thoughts on on this letter and you know to kind of help us shape our expectations of of what we're talking about here yes thank you for the opportunity to do that jen holler i'm the policy director for the vermont housing and conservation board um it's always a privilege to be appearing with um, josh and maura and sarah um we um work so often together that i can pretty much anticipate what everybody's going to say, um, and w once in a while they surprise me. But um, but we have been in regular contact over um, the last few months, and as Josh explained, the um, the House Appropriations creation of uh, um, the Housing Recovery Working Group kind of formalized and focused our discussions really around how are we going to make the best use of the ARPA um, funds. Um, I. In the American Rescue Plan Act, there are a number of categorical grant programs that flow through federal agencies, including the emergency rental assistance that you've heard. There will be more housing um, vouchers that um, were reflected in Richard Williams' letter to you. Um, there uh, will be some home funds that come to the state, a smaller amount, um, but uh, those will be arriving, oh boy, sometime this fall as well. But primarily what we're focused on in the working group right now is how do we use the $1 billion in fiscal um, relief funds that are coming to the state that are more flexible. Um, to sort of put the letter in context a little bit, um, just a quick review of kind of the timeline of these discussions, and that is that um, the House recognized uh, the tremendous need for housing. They um, increased what the governor had recommended to VHCB and in other sources by um, quite a bit. Um, it then sent the, um, and for which we are very grateful, thank you. And also um, that thanks extends to this committee because it's been your advocacy over many years. I think that backed that up. Um, then the budget went over to the Senate. They are, uh, um, you know, they worked on their version. And during that time period, Governor Scott put forward his plan for the billion dollars that's really focused on capital investment. And it was part of that plan that he said, let's dedicate $249 million of this um, specifically to housing for capital. So on the Senate side, they uh, took a look at that. The committees of jurisdiction have, didn't have a ton of time to sort it through. The Senate said, okay, we're gonna do a little bit more. 
they did allocate 12 million of ARPA, um, one piece that the governor had recommended to expand shelter capacity and permanent housing for people who are experiencing homelessness, um, increase the amount that would come to VHCB for all types of housing, including um, that targeted towards homelessness, but then said we need a little more time to think about how we want to um, allocate the rest of the ARPA money. And we'll do that when we come back next year. So it seems to me that that's kind of the big question on the table. I think that there's general agreement it, and no real debate, I think, around the desire to use this amount of money from ARPA for housing. It seems to be that that's a, a pretty much a consensus opinion. It seems to me that the disagreement or the questions before everyone now are the pace at which it gets allocated. Um, we know we can use it. We know it's needed. We know it can be done well. ARPA allows it to be used over a few years. So how much gets targeted now and how much is later? So it was in that context that the, um, the recovery working group, um, which had been assigned with submitting an interim report by April 30th, thought that it was more appropriate since we didn't have any ARPA rules yet or specific guidance. We thought a letter was more appropriate. Um, and in that letter, we all agreed and asked the legislature with great thanks and appreciation for all the resources that already have been included in the House and Senate versions of the budget for it to take another look at the governor's plan and to see if there weren't ways in which it could feel comfortable allocating more towards ARPA. So that's um, just to get back to the letter and, and, the, um, and kind of the purpose of that and why it's come to you this way. The other thing that VHCB can offer right now is that um, with the $10 million that the legislature and the governor agreed to from H315, the fast track bill for rapid response homelessness projects, we have now received $38 million in applications for that. Um, the applications came in on Monday, so we're still vetting and scrubbing them. But it's about 220 um, of new apartments and beds, about 137, 140 would be specifically dedicated to the homeless. So. Um, Again, we're, we're going to be reviewing those applications, taking them to our board um, for the, its consideration in June. But that gives you a sense of if you just early on say $10 million is available, we got 38 in requests. So it gives you a sense of the scope and the need and what's, what's possible out there. In response to questions um, from legislators and legislative staff to VHCB about how quickly can this money really move and how much do you really need and when do you need it? How much do you need now versus next year or the year after? Gus and our housing director are in the process of reaching out to people around the state to get more details around the actual timing of those 30 projects that are mentioned in the letter around um, um, that are in the pipeline now, um, as well as any other opportunities that they're seeing. So I uh, just want to acknowledge that that's, that's what we're working on right now and we'll be responding to those questions. I guess another couple things um, I'd like to mention is that the governor's proposal also included, you know, money for VHIP, which we think has been a really valuable um, and successful program. It's a different model. It meets a different kind of need and it goes to Josh's point of a whole continuum of types of housing um, and the need to kind of tackle this is issue from a variety of different, with a variety of different approaches. The governor's proposal also included a, a pilot project, um, a home builder pilot project. And we think that that's a valuable thing to explore as well. Um, and would ask the legislature to take another look um, at that um, to see if that might be possible to do. I'm going to look at my notes here and see if there's anything. Um, I guess the I guess the um, one other thing to highlight as we review, um, not even to highlight, but to mention as we review the applications that have come in, um, we now have a little bit more information than um, uh, and, and the, the cost per unit um, range quite a bit. Um, and we can have more information about that soon. Um, but I guess, uh, I guess what I am trying to say is that the Housing Recovery Working Group and the governor's plan 
we're all providing the best information we have at the time that it's submitted to you. And like any plan, it can continue to be refined and we'll have better and more information as we go. But there's absolutely no question that this full amount of funding can and needs to be used. Um, and we hope the legislature will, will think about how it can be committed, when it's comfortable committing it. And if there's a reservation about committing it all right now in this budget, is there a mechanism that might be able to be established that sets it aside and it can be um, for housing and then it could be um, further released at a different time? So that was very ineloquently said, but I think you get my, I think you get where I'm going. <laughs> and so I, with that, I'd be happy to take any, any questions. Um, before I get to Representative Bloomley, I just want to point out that we're, we're going to be voting on S79 this afternoon. So VHIP as a rule doesn't quite exist yet. Um, the pilot program was there last year, but we've been talking about it for so long that it feels like it does. Um, and uh, anxious to get that going um, if we can get it out of committee today. So, um, and I don't, I wanna get to the, I'll go to Representative Bloomley. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe, maybe I should have said the beta version of VHIP. There you go. Um, Representative Bloomley. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I, I still like Tommy, I, I, sorry, Representative Waltz, I need the, I need, I need, I need something that will help me connect the dots uh, between different pots of funding and um, uh, you know what's already been allocated um, versus what um, what you all have been talking about. That said, um, I mean, I, I, I we, we're in a really interesting place, right? I mean, there the, when you say moonshot. It feels like it, given what I know about what's been allocated for funding in the past. And I, I guess, Jen, I was, I, my question really went to the point that you raised, which was, you know, is there a mechanism, given the fact that the guidelines aren't out, and that's been an issue on the floor, um, <clears throat> you know, reluctance to release money for something um, uh, that, you know, when the guidelines aren't aren't yet hammered out, but. But is there, is there such a mechanism? Um, and I'm I'm just raising that um, uh, with the committee because I I'm hopeful that we can discuss that and or maybe you already know the answer to that, Mr. Chair. So, but I I I do think uh, I I really hear you and hadn't thought a lot about the need to signal. Okay, this is all in the pipe. Look, you know we're gonna we're gonna be ready to go. This money is gonna be available. Um, so you need to get ready too. So thanks very much. Um, Gus, I saw that you joined late. I don't know if you had any further comments that you wanted to add to, um, to Jen's. Um, and we're certainly gonna get you in the next chunk of time too, but on, on this letter. Um, I guess I just want to, I think Jen was extraordinarily eloquent, um, despite her saying otherwise. Um, but to Representative Bloomley's um, question, I guess I would just add that last year, when the administration was very unsure about what the rules would be for CRF, you, the legislature, went ahead and allocated significant funds to us, $33 million dollars to get things moving because you said this is the right thing to do. I actually had us. And as we sat with uh, the technical assistance advisors to the administration last year, they told the administration this was the highest of risk to spend monies in the way you had directed us to spend them. Uh, but we figured out how to get to yes. We have a much friendlier administration in Washington. So I would just say, I think the risks are lower today than they were a year ago when you, and the reality of having, as I'm sure Sarah talked about before I joined the call, so many Vermonters still living in motels prompts the need for swift action. So there's a, there's a moment to take risk. And I think this is, this crisis, this pandemic is one of them. Representative Murphy. 
Thank you, Chair Stevens. I, I may have missed this earlier and I apologize if I'm requesting repeated information. I, I have heard mention the 30 projects a couple of times and I just wondered if there was a ballpark figure of, of an allocation that, that would give indication to any contractors that those 30 projects were on a roll and were gonna be funded, et cetera. If there was a dollar figure that went along with the number of projects. I'm certainly not ready to share that number, I, but Maura, you may have more detail than I do. Well, just that the 30 projects that we're talking about are just the rental housing projects, but we know that there's a crunch on a need for homeownership projects as well, and that doesn't include that, so I'm hesitant to quantify the number of rental projects without similarly sending a signal to our um, home developers who may be convinced, we hope will be convinced to set aside some affordable units in where they wouldn't otherwise. And so in, and then on top of that, we have um, shelter investments as has been discussed and um, the VHIP program and things like that. So that 30 was just the rental housing pipeline. I believe that the pipeline is far greater. And so. Um, and that discussion of pipeline, I mean, it's, it's, I, I think there's a question of, is there a list? And I think the reality is that there's a, there's a, a, a desktop of filing, you know, where it's like, well, in Central Vermont, that housing organization may have two projects going. In Bennington, there might be a project in, in St. J. So it's all, and, and as Mara said, it, it's all right now, that, that pipeline sounds like it's all rental housing projects. So I just, um, I just, I think as we move forward, we've heard, um, and, I, and I, as we move forward, you know, we've heard that the moonshot includes X number of units. You know, I think Josh, You've used the number of five thousand as 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 the reach here, and so you know we just want to balance the dream of that along with the um, con you know keeping to check in to make sure we're either going to achieve that or get to you know a, a what well how does that how does that goal change over time and that's not for that's not for this year but I appreciate no. the it, vision. It, it, you know? Yeah, and, and I do as well. And I, I, I totally appreciate not seeing it as, well, this would be enough to satisfy people. I'm just looking for a dollar figure. And I would offer that the if, if we could get, um, know that we had allocated sufficient to get that rental housing truly up and running, that's our immediate crisis and getting folks out of the hotel, not to downplay the crisis of buying a home, because I totally understand that as well. But we're looking at a very near deadline of getting people out of hotel rooms. And so I know that telling someone they can start building isn't going to even meet that need. But I was looking to see if you had a dollar figure for this portion, since the 30 projects keeps being mentioned as being ready. I mean, I guess I, if I could just add, um, you know, $249 million seems like a ton of money in a moonshot, you know, but the reality is there's more project, you know, we could spend double that. And um, if you look at the broadband, um, you know, 250 million. Well, if you listen to Commissioner Tierney, she says, actually the cost is a billion, but you know, we know we can't get a full billion. We're in the same situation with housing. I mean, that list of 30 potential projects that are, you know, in a pipeline, you know, some of the challenges there of sharing all the details it's just not feasible. Um, a lot of those, um, do, you know, those projects have to spend money to get to a point that they can submit an application. And they are, there's often deals in the works and, and, and information that can't be shared publicly or those deals could be jeopardized. Um, so that's the, the, the situation we're in. I know, you know, one particular project that has been working for years and they've said, if we don't get a yes in the next year, we've already lost $200,000 in the project's debt, you know? And so that's the reality out there. Um, and, and, you know, so I have no, absolutely no doubt that we can spend $249 million on housing. The 5,000 unit goal is a goal. You know, we're gonna stretch every dollar as far as we can to meet every demand. You know, that's the number of units that in many reports that have said we need, we need more than that. And the strategies to get there 
will be different subsidy amounts for all different types. You know, on, on the VHIP side, you know, we're going to average 22, 23, $24,000 per investment on the, uh, rapid, uh, emergency permanent housing. You know, the numbers are baked in at $150,000 per unit of just ARPA. You know, there could be other leverage. So it's really hard to say, give us an average cost per subsidy per unit because the strategies vary, the subsidies vary, and we're always going to leverage what we can quickly. And we're going to try to get the best deal. And the goal is as many units as possible. But, um, you know, we, we will revise and rep our plan and we will report as we go. And I think that everyone on this team wants to get as many units as possible and stretch these dollars. And we have, there's a broad, there's a big goal out there for that number of units, you know, but we also work in reality and, and sort of deal with what comes at us and what we can affect. And those don't always match up on day one when you guys have to decide if it's a, a good plan and those are dollars worth investing. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind, we can spend every penny of that and we'll get as many units as we possibly can through various strategies. Yeah. If I may, just a couple um, things that um, I um, would like to add. And one is uh, backing up what Maura had said around the 4% low income housing tax credits. Um, it's a mythical unicorn in, in the fact that we're all sort of chasing it, but we do know how to use them. We've used them quite a bit here in the state for preservation projects and others. So it's, um, we're chasing it, but it's not a mystery. I mean, we, the developers in Vermont know how to use those and it's really only been limited by what other grant funding has been available to go with them because they take more of that. So I guess I just would like to be able to uh, project confidence that, that if the dollars if more capital dollars are available, we're going to be able to use those more for four percent. There's, um, um, there's not a mystery about about how to do that. And then the other thing I would um, add is that we or V, I can speak for VHCB in this instance. Appreciate that the House dedicated general funds for this purpose, and then the Senate decided to do more. And we feel that that's really important because it allows us the flexibility to do things like farm worker housing or home access or perhaps some um, uh, more middle income type projects um, that may or may not be and likely aren't going to be eligible for ARPA funds. I mean, I think there will be restrictions around the ARPA funds around, you know, immigration status and that kind of thing. Um, as, as well, the general funds just to allow us, we know how to leverage those better. Um, Sometimes there are restrictions on federal funds and how you can match those up with other federal programs. So um, I'll just, uh, I'll turn it, I'll make it a thank you. Thank you for doing that. We hope it sticks. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to end us here um, because we're going to, we're going to again move over, over to a, it's more like a housing 201, I think. Saying 101 is such a January thing. Um, but Sarah, Gus, Jen, Mora, Josh, um, thank you so much for, for this speed through on this. It's, um, again, I have to um, appreciate the, the, the work that you're doing um, to face this on in, in, in such a change such a changed world and um, appreciate your work and the hours that you're putting in on our behalf to try to make this so. And um, we will continue to do our part as well. And part of that is gathering this information so we know better um, how we can help shape that policy. So policies, um, because to your point, uh, Commissioner, there's a wide range of things that we're talking about here. Um, including the services and including what Sarah's Sarah's um, shop needs to do. So with that committee, let's take um, let's take five or six minutes just offline.